Hello everybody, I hope you're having a fantastic day. I'm having a great day because I'm reliving my childhood. If you're anything like me, back in the 80s you would wander in the back corner of the store and you would find these engineer's mini notebooks by a guy named Forrest Mims III. And uh, you know, I had the money to maybe buy one every week or two and I would get them and look through them and see all the crazy experiments you could do. Now, we didn't have any internet. There was no way to look things up. Uh, you know, so we'd take copious amounts of notes and uh, hope that maybe one day you could afford things like the 555 timer and all the other parts that would go along with it and maybe build some of these projects and become an engineering genius like Mr. T. Or maybe you're a little older or you found something like this at the uh, garage sale. You've got these old music projects and these other Radio Shack communications projects and transistor projects and this 555 popular source book with experiments book, things like that. Um, but the question is, how many of us really actually built the circuits? As a kid, I had dreams of putting all these parts together with this 2N3906 and making my own infrared security alarm just like they had at the front of the Radio Shack store or my own toy organ. But the reality is I never actually built any of these things. So a couple of years ago, I began thinking it would be kind of cool to have all the circuits that were in this book on little circuit boards so that you could build them and not just stick them in a breadboard like this one where it gets pulled apart or it gets loose and stops working, but you could make something kind of permanent to memorialize these books and do all the experiments that we wish we would have done when we were kids. Unfortunately, I didn't know jack squat about PCB design, so I asked all my friends that knew how to do circuit board design if they could make the boards, and they thought my idea was stupid. But the joke's gonna be on them when I'm raking in literally tens of pennies of revenue from this video because I made the boards myself with the help of PCB Way. That's right, I taught myself KiCad and went through the process one by one of taking every one of the schematics in this book and turning it into a PCB thanks to PCB Way. You see, it was really simple. I went in there, threw the parts on the board, did a little bit of wiring, sent it up to PCB Way. Five bucks for 10 videos. The shipping was cheap. I combined these and all the other boards together to make it even cheaper. And the boards were to my door in about a week. And that's one of the awesome things about PCB Way. I was able to go out there and go out on a limb and try this new thing and get the boards. And you know what? They actually worked the first time, which is amazing. And if they didn't work the first time, it'd only be five bucks to order another set and try again. So there's no fear with PCB Way. But I want to thank them for sponsoring this video and helping this dream to come true. One of the first things that I had to decide when making these boards is that they're made to be experimental. You see, if you put this capacitor and this resistor and this, you get these results. But if you put this capacitor and this resistor, then you get these results. And so the idea is that parts are made to be switched in and out of this. And so I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, I was inspired by things like these old Radio Shack learning lab kits here. And uh, this is a slightly more modern one, but they had these spring terminals and you would stick resistors in there and be able to swap parts in and out and things like that. And I wanted you to have the option to do that. Um, but what I think is gonna be more practical and easier for people to find are these little screw terminals. And so these things are readily available on both Amazon and AliExpress. So you just take the little five millimeter terminal and you put it on the PCB and solder it. And then after that, you can use a standard Phillips or flat screwdriver. But these holes are actually big enough that if you do happen to have spring terminals, you can put them here. Uh, so it's kind of nice to have the option. I think most people are going to want to use these little screw terminals. They're readily available. They're cheap. And, uh, you know, they're going to stay in there really well. But if you want to use spring terminals for nostalgia, you can do that. Um, so just an overall thing of the board. I designed these uh, circuits basically based on the input voltage. So some of these will require five to 15 volts. I've got some other ones. This one isn't one, but I've got some other ones that require nine volts, especially the sound circuits and stuff like that. You won't go wrong using nine volts on all of them, but essentially what you do is you put your input voltage here and then there's little jumpers here so that you can enable or disable the separate sections of the board. So these are all isolated from each other. And that's really nice because you can work on this one, then you can work on this one, then you can put the two together and do all kinds of fun stuff like that. So again, um, it was really fun to build these, but we need to show what they look like when they're built up. 
Okay, so the first circuit we're going to take a look at today is the basic monostable circuit. And it is basic because it's a relatively simple circuit, and it's also basic because it is one of the foundational circuits uh, as far as how the 555 is used. And so just looking at it without getting into the theory, if you push the button, the um, LED turns on, and then after a period of time, the LED turns off. So about as simple as you can get. Now, what we have going on here is, uh, according to the circuit, we have a trigger, and that trigger is represented by the button. So when we push this button, we are triggering the trigger pin low, and that sends the output pin high. So we've got the output coming out um, right here, and that goes high, and that output will stay high until it is reset and so what happens is the way you can picture that is um let's picture this capacitor here as a bucket uh it could be any size bucket but we're going to say right now that it's a medium bucket and this right here is a garden hose and so essentially what's happening is the electricity is flowing through this garden hose into this bucket and when the bucket gets two-thirds full and what's two-thirds? Two-thirds is two-thirds of the supply voltage that we're using here. So if I have nine volts coming in here, then when this bucket gets filled up to being six volts, then all of a sudden this thing is going to reset and it's going to send this um, pin back low and turn off the LED. So let me show you this actually happening on the oscilloscope and maybe that will help you visualize it. So I brought the oscilloscope up on the screen and as you can see when I push this button uh, we'll begin to see this capacitor fill up and when it gets to two-thirds of the source voltage which is nine volts the LED will turn off. There you go floating up and down. Floating up and down. And so uh, as many times you push the button you will get that effect over and over and over again. Now if you think about it um, one of the things you could do is add a bigger bucket and so therefore it would take longer for the bucket to fill up and that would keep the led on longer you could also have a smaller bucket and if you have a smaller bucket it'll fill up faster you could also change the size of the garden hose so if you fill it up with a fire hose it's going to fill up really quickly if you fill it up with a teeny 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 straw it'll take a long time so let's demonstrate that so we are going to take out the 100 microfarad capacitor and we are going to replace it with a thousand microfarad capacitor. They are polarized, so pay attention to which order uh, you put them in, in. But if you think about it, if you keep the garden hose the same size, but you make the bucket 10 times larger, it will take 10 times longer to fill the bucket up. And so we are going to reconnect the scope. And I'm going to push record. And we're gonna power the unit back up. I'm going to push the button. And you'll see now that that is raising way slower than it was before because the capacitor is 10 times as large. I'm not going to demonstrate it in this video, but you can imagine that if I also uh, cut the resistor by a factor of 10, that it would fill up much faster. If I added more resistance, then it would fill up slower. That's basically what's going on on the monostable circuit. The next foundational circuit we're going to take a look at is the basic A-stable circuit, which is similar to the monostable, except that it does all its flipping and flopping automatically. So whereas on our monostable circuit, we would push this button to trigger and send the LED high, what's going on here is this one has a couple of comparators inside the chip that we're going to use to automatically turn the LED on and off. So you may be familiar with a multimeter that will tell you the voltage of something and a comparator is kind of similar, except instead of telling you that a voltage is a certain voltage, it tells you if it is higher or lower than a certain voltage. So essentially what we have going on here is there's two comparators inside the chip and one of them is looking to see when the voltage coming out of the capacitor is higher than two thirds of the voltage on that's incoming and then it would turn it off and when it is lower than two-thirds it would turn it back on and we basically have the same concept here where the capacitor is being filled through a resistor the only difference is over here we actually have a voltage divider that you can see right here on pin seven and what that does is that prevents the voltage from actually dropping all the way down to zero it goes just a little bit higher to prevent any kind of timing issues so we're going to turn it on and you will see that um, although there's a little bit of staggering on the camera, you can see the thing is turning on and off on its own with no external button. 
So as I'm sure you could imagine, the size of this capacitor or the size of the garden hose will affect how fast that flashing happens. Let's take a look. So I have taken this 22 microfarad capacitor and replaced it with a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. Again, smaller bucket being filled up with the same hose and our flipping and flopping should happen much faster. There you go. Let's hook that up to the scope so that we can see how it looks. And as you can see, it's happening so fast that we can barely see it with our own eyes. And that is the basic A-stable circuit. All right, the next circuit we're going to take a look at is the frequency divider. And as you can tell, although there's not a lot of components on the actual circuit, we're getting a little bit more complicated. So let's take a look. Uh, we've got a one mega ohm potentiometer here and here. Um, we've got a capacitor, which is right here, which can be uh, varied from anywhere from 0 0.001 microfarads to 10 microfarads. We have this decoupling capacitor here, not really super important, but what is important is that on pin two, we have an input from some sort of function generator trigger type thing. And then on this side, we've got an output and that is what is dividing the frequency. Now dividing the frequency is kind of a funny term, uh, but let's just take a look at it and we'll kind of put it into some simple terms. Uh, as you look here in the example, we have a frequency, a square wave starts at the bottom, goes up and, you know, does square wavy type things. On this side, we sort of have the inverse of that. If you look, the square wave is actually going down. And uh, so we have sort of an inverse, forget the parts that are missing, we have an inverse of the square wave coming in. So if you want to visualize what's going on here, um, every single time this input frequency goes high, this one wants to go low. Um, it wants to pass the frequency straight through, but we have this capacitor and resistor over here. And so what they're doing is it's, I would consider this more of a frequency blocker. Uh, so if you look here, you notice that these triggers are always across from each other. All the examples, the trigger on the one below is, you know, has to be below one of the existing triggers that are going high that forces this one low. The difference is sort of the missing teeth in the middle here. And so what causes the missing teeth? Like most things in a 555 timer, you have a combination of a resistor and a capacitor. Now we're not gonna geek too much out on the math, but the idea is that we have resistance in ohms by capacitance in farads, full farads, um, times 1.1. So something along the lines of if you have a hundred thousand ohms here dialed in and you've got 10 microfarads here, that would be 0 0.00001. Um, and you times that out, you times a hundred thousand for the ohms by 0 0.0001. Uh, you get one and then you times that by 1.1. And that means that this will block the signal for 1.1 seconds. All right, we're going to try to use big, round, crazy frequencies. So let's say that you've got a pulse on your input that comes in every one second. So we, we go high at one second, which means we go here low at one second. And then you've got that 10, 10 microfarad capacitor. 100 kilohertz resistance there. So you're blocking for 1.1 seconds. So what happens is this thing is preventing the output on the timer for 1.1 seconds. Well, you've got a timer that's trying to trigger every one second, which means that when the second pulse comes in, you're actually going to miss it because the thing is holding it low. So you've got a pulse at one second, you've got a block for 1.1. So you're blocking out the 1.1. Well, right back here, you had a trigger at one second and you're totally going to miss that so then this thing you know is skipped and then all of a sudden you're back on schedule at the third pulse and that's what happens um basically you're blocking this stuff out so it's equivalent to if we were to take this other frequency uh a stable circuit here it's essentially like let's say if you had an led and this led was on all the time or even flashing if you were to stick something in front of that and block it for periods of time, then although all the stuff is going on in the background, from your perspective, you're only seeing the output at the time that it's not being blocked by the notebook. And that's what the frequency divider is doing. So if I bring up my little unity function generator here, you can see that I'm generating a frequency, a square wave at every 500 Hertz. And if you look up here on the oscilloscope that I'll pop up on the screen, you can see that right now everything is sort of in uh in sync the yellow line is what i'm reading on this output here the pink line 
is the input from the function generator. And as you can see, just as I said before, they are the opposite. So it is, um, you know, it is inversing this frequency. And as I very slowly adjust here, I'm going to try to just adjust a little bit. So it's a little, it's rolling a little bit there, but you can see that when the time is increased, we're skipping a whole bunch of those pinks. So like essentially the pink is a pulse and you can see that the yellow one is skipping tons of those pink spots. So we are essentially dividing the frequency out and only allowing one for every so many to come through. I'm not going to bother tuning in the scope, but as you can see, we still have this set for 500 Hertz, but in the upper right hand corner of the scope, you can see that we're only triggering about once every 20 Hertz. We're way below what this thing is designed to handle, but you get the idea that we're only getting a very small fraction of this signal through. And if I tune it up to something a little bit more stable, you can see that like right now we're at 62 Hertz and you can go all the way up to 500 if you just set it, you know, if you max it out. So anyway, you play with it and you can do some kind of fun stuff with the frequency divider. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on the touch switch. It's very similar to the mono stable. So on this one, you push and uh, the capacitor determines how long this light is going to stay lit. And on this one, you push and the capacitor determines how long this thing's going to stay lit. As you can see, I've got a small one there. The difference is that over here on pin two on this one, it's floating to make it more, uh, you know, more susceptible to the touch. And this may not seem like a big deal to us, but back in the 80s, things like this were basically unheard of. You didn't have very many things that just used any sort of capacitive touch. So um, back in the day, this is a very kind of cool, ingenious way to, um, to use a 555 timer. So uh, we have it, respect for the past, and we've made our little touch switch. So there you have it. These are the first four circuits that I made out of the Forest Mims 555 mini notebook. Uh, let me know what you think. I'm sure there are some people in the comments who will tell me I'm wrong and they're probably correct. Uh, there's a lot more technical detail that we could get into. There's people that have spent their entire lives using these chips in all kinds of creative ways. So I'd love to have your feedback. Let me know if this idea in general is something you're interested in. I don't have to make videos on every one of these things. Uh, I'm sort of doing this for myself, but if you guys are interested in coming along for the ride, let me know. I've also thought about bundling all the PCBs into sort of a kit at the end. Uh, you know, so you don't have to go to PCB way and buy 10 of them, um, you know, for every single one. Honestly, if you want to have a little eBay side business, buying 10 of each one, selling them as kits would be pretty sweet. So the opportunity is there if you're interested. So anyway, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.